Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the High Vault Web Talk. It is fall. It is the first session in 21 in the fall, together with Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn. Again, he's the Director of Business Development here at High Vault. And we are broadcasting, Uwe, as every time live from Dresden. Right. So, at a very beautiful day mm -hmm. today at our 9th of November. And, uh, yeah, that's also a special day in German history, but I think this is not the topic of today. Today is the question, how can we make history in terms of uh, the energy transition Absolutely. or Energiewende. Yeah, the Energiewende, the energy transition is in every mouse. As you say, it's really a topic that you cannot discuss enough and we have the best experts here today for discussing it. But first of all, um, we are here in Dresden at Highwald, again in the big hall. Yep. And um, I think you have a new subject of business. Um, it is high-end photography. Is that right? That's high-end photography, <laughs> yeah. So I think we can make a small turn to my left. Here we can see then uh, our latest uh, product development, which is actually brought then also into service. And uh, as you can see, or maybe you cannot see, this is my preparation for exactly this part. It's an empty cart because this is a project uh, I was heavily involved in the last years. And uh, what we have done here is a test system for offshore testing of inter-array cables. These are the cables which are connecting the different uh, wind turbines in strings to a platform. And what we can see here is on the very right side the our containers where we have uh, then all the things to transport then the equipment offshore. Then we have the reactors, we have the excited transformers and uh, also the power electronic uh, feeding unit. And here at the far end, what you can see on the left side, this is the connection point where we then uh, connect the cable under test. And uh, this system has to be also then ready for offshore operation. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important topic, how to get such kind of equipment to a level that it can operate under this uh, very uh, different yeah. conditions as we can see are onshore. Absolutely. Nevertheless, we forgot something. Yes, we have the possibility to participate. No. no. At the beginning, oh. we missed something. And yes. this was the first slide, what uh, I would like to remember. Yeah because we have Slido, and yes. therefore the first slide. So Slido is our tool to get your questions to our experts. So please use the link you can see on the screen, mm -hmm. and uh, then you can uh, put in your questions there. Nevertheless, we still have active uh, guys in the background uh, in our back office. Uh, in case you like to ask a question via the chat function at the YouTube channel, you can also put the questions there they will have then the duty to uh, forward it directly to my desk. Absolutely interactive and of course, like uh, w if we are half time through this uh, one hour session, then we have uh, enough questions certainly to answer them sure. together with our experts. But another very interesting slide we prepared. Yep. And this is the second slide. I hope we get it. Oh yeah. So this slide was taken or the pictures were taken last night around uh, 8 uh, PM, because uh, we are actually live on the platform and on the right slide you see this blue uh, thing. So this is the offshore test unit uh, on the platform and uh, on the lowest deck there are the cables to be tested and uh, that gives a certain complexity also for the stuff on site. And mm -hmm. what you can see there, the colleagues uh, on site, the guy with the blue helmet, this is Tommy uh, Winkler from Highwald. Uh, we will hear something from him later on. And the other colleagues of JDR, uh, the company who is uh, joining us uh, today and yeah. uh, which are doing the installation, the manufacturing, the installation of uh, the array cables which will be tested then with our system. And we have in addition to that yeah. a small video so, uh, so that we get an impression what was the weather out there this oh. morning. So maybe we can get this With original seconds. sound. I mean, this is really heavy wind outside. Where are we here in the North Sea? 
that's uh, 100 kilometers are, are east of the British coast. Okay, pretty of the English coast. So <laughs> pretty correct. high waves, and everybody who is an expert can imagine what is it like to work out there, to make really the daily job there. This is hard weather condition, and the video is about two minutes. No, no. this is. That's enough. That's uh, enough. Thank so you So we very have much. seen the waves and uh, now I think it's important that we get a little bit more insights Absolute. from the experts. Absolutely. I want to present you the experts while you can join your desk already and I'm going to join my desk. We have one expert here. It's Detlef Herzog. He is live with me in Dresden. Hello, Mr. Herzog. Hello, Hello. Detlef. We have a seat and then, first of all, we have some of you not here in the room live. We have you connected via our system. System. We have Ross Piercy, he's the asset manager, JDR Cable JDR. Systems. Hello, hello. And Alex McPie, he is the CTO at JDR Cable Systems. And they are sitting, I think, Alex and Ross in uh, Newcastle, as I learned, upon Tyne. Is that true? <laughs> yes, we are indeed. And are you in different rooms or are you kind of uh, in, in, uh, next to each other having a cup of tea? With the wonders of technology, unfortunately, we're in separate rooms. <laughs> Great. <coughs> Excellent to have you here. We're going to discuss with you, Ross and Alex. Then with us here live in Dresden is Detlef Herzog. He is the project engineer, electrical engineering of Omexom Renewable Energy Offshore GmbH. That's the correct yep. title. Hello, Detlef. Nice to have you here. Hello. And uh, hopefully to, uh, that you ask also the questions that we discuss with each other. And then the deputy head of Omexom Inspection, a wind turbine expert, we have Michael Greiner with us. He is sitting, Hello? I think, directly, Michael, on a platform. Is that true? No, no, no. no. That's, uh, I, I'm sitting in my lovely basement uh, working from the home office. Okay, great. But you are, okay, you are windproof there. Yeah, I am definitely windproof. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, sure. And as you know, the web talk here, the High Vault web talk, um, ladies and gentlemen, we always start with an expert statement. And I want to give you um, Ross Pierce's statement for this subject to discuss with you about it. With the ongoing boom in offshore wind accelerating, of course, more and more accelerating, it is critical for one side, the operators, and on the other side, the insurers, to have confidence in the cable system and its accessories. This installation, the installation process, can be complex with many challenges, of course, as you all know. This increases the risk of significantly to the system. Installations are carried by 40-plus skilled fiber optic MV, HV technicians, and the quality of workmanship is a critical factor to the success of the installation. Controlling this offshore is imperative. So, Ross, what makes offshore so special? Well, firstly, as we already saw earlier on today, we had the uh, the video of the, the CTV bringing in uh, oh, yeah. people to the turbine. And you can see from that, that weather condition is is really, really quite something. And it's difficult for the guys um, and everyone that works offshore to, to get used to that. But that is the way in which they need to transfer at all times. But if we go back to why we're offshore in the first place, of course, you know, in the UK, uh, like many places in the world, it's very windy, but those winds are strongest offshore. And so the environment is perfect for, for wind generation. Uh, also, because of that openness and the fact that there's minimal disruptions from towns and cities, uh, noise and aesthetic situations that occur with onshore wind can actually go a lot bigger with the turbines. Um, to the point where nowadays we're at, we're at turbine sizes of sort of 100 meters uh, long in blade size, which which is quite significant on a on a 12 megawatt uh, wind turbine. So we've got that side of things. Uh, then you know we we look at the, the challenge, and I touched on the weather there. Uh, operational limits are extremely uh, extremely tight, and and actually you wouldn't believe uh, how little waves you need to actually cause a problem offshore. So. Uh, when we look at wind height, uh, sort of wave heights of say two meters, um, we actually then get into a situation where it's very difficult for us to transfer offshore, which makes it hard to get people onto assets, which essentially is what what, what we're trying to do uh, to keep uptime at maximum. 
we then, of course, got the logistics side of it. Unlike the UK our onshore wind farm market, where you need uh, nuts, bolts, washers, things like that, very quickly. When you're offshore, the situation changes significantly. The planning side of the project is much more significant. And with, with the logistics side, you, you not only need to consider um, who you're having in your team, but also how you're going to execute the plan offshore. So, for example, just to get offshore alone, you know, you need marine coordination, you need port services, um, you you need vessels, you need CTV access, you need access to helicopters. Uh, you could be um, 30, 40 nautical miles offshore, which which means that you are effectively on your own. Communication can be very poor, so you need to set up those systems. Um, so just to get small things offshore um, is incredibly difficult. Um, for example, a null bolt could set your project back days, which could be costing hundreds of thousands of pounds. So it's really extremely challenging, different layers. And um, I had uh, the information just now. Of course, we want to learn a little bit more about JDR, Alex. Um, could you give us a short oversight over the company JDR Cable Systems? Oh, we need to... I think you... Yeah. There we are. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. There's Always the, always the first time. <laughs> uh, so, so JDR family was founded in 1966. Uh, so we're sort of coming into the, the middle of our sort of fifth decade of operation. For me, we, we've progressed through sort of oil and gas, which still forms a bit of our business. But now we, we see sort of real heavy growth in the offshore renewable market. That's uh, been since 2009 when we opened the, the factory in Hartlepool. From we've been involved in some of the, the, the largest wind farms, you know, for me, and as an interarray cable supplier. We, for me, we see that market just continuing to grow. And uh, actually, the, the, the slide that you've just put up sort of shows the announcement of our new facility. So we have moved from uh, having two operational plants in the UK and this uh, third plant in uh, Camois and Blythe just to, to the north of Newcastle so maybe 30 miles north of where myself and Ross are sitting will be a plant that will take us into the, the next generation so this will be 132 kV and above for me in the first phase for me in the second phase we'll move on to HVDC and into you know sort of you know, extreme high voltage for me. So we, we, we're setting ourselves up to be a, a player in this market, you know, for the, the next 20, 30 years with this investment. That plant will become operational in sort of 24. And what that allows us to do, out with, you can see the, the sort of static wind farms, inter-array cables, the sort of high voltages they are now, 66 kV exports that we do. It will allow us to move into longer length, export cables, higher voltages, you know, and for me really sort of allow us to then focus the remaining plants on floating offshore wind, which I'm sure will be a maybe an interesting discussion for another day, which will be a, an even bigger challenge than, than we see just now for me with the, the, the static platforms. So it's exciting it's times and a lots of opportunities in, in this market. Great. Thank you very much, Alex, for this insight. Um, coming to Detlef Herzog here, um, you brought also your statement uh, to this discussion today regarding a trustable subsea wind farm internal grid. The subsea cables, of course, plays an important role here. It has to be well designed, well produced, tested and installed. To perform retesting to determine the condition of the grid or locate faults, some test results of the testing after installation shall be reducible reproducible without stressing the grid components. So challenges have to be solved onshore. Offshore components must be fitting and operational. Also quite complex. Detlef, what makes offshore for you so special? Yeah, For me it's the combination of uh, building such a huge electrical infrastructure mm -hmm. in the sea Uh, together with uh, all the marine logistics that has to be in place and uh, that everything is quite well prepared 
before sailout mm -hmm. and uh, gets out there in a healthy, good condition that it's operational at the end. So uh, everybody has yeah, to be well trained and uh, fit for this job. Yeah, that's imagine. it. This is every day really some challenges. Uh, we talked about it before that uh, there is nothing what cannot happen out there. Really nothing. <laughs> you have to think about everything. Michael Greiner, um, working as a deputy head of um, Oxemon Inspection, a wind turbine expert, could you give us a, a little bit of an insight about the company Omexom? Yeah, that's um, easy to say. Basically, Omexom belongs to uh, the Vinci, uh, the France-based Vinci Group. Um, I think we also have a slide prepared for that. Yes, yes, yes. we're bringing it in. Okay. So, um, yeah, and Vinci is a big French-based company. Basically, it has two big business areas. Uh, the one is the area called concessions, which means operations of technical infrastructure like motorways or airports. While on the other side, we have the contracting unit, which uh, basically covers engineering and construction. And we as Omexom, we belong to the subgroup of Winchi Energies. And if you go to the next slide, within uh, this energy group, Omexom basically covers everything, every service we have available relating to offshore wind farms. So in principle, we can do everything for an offshore wind farm except maintenance of the wind turbines itself. And if you see it, all these services, I'm not going to read them out now, but we have the management services available for constructing and operating a wind farm, um, supervise uh, uh, and monitor what is going on after the installation. Whenever they come, it comes to any um, problems, we have a solutions engineering uh, taking care of um, A problems, root cause analysis, solution. And in the end, we have uh, uh, some teams available which can go out there to the turbines, to the substation, check whatever is going on there, do maintenance, retrofits, and whatever is uh, required over the 25 years lifetime of a wind farm. So, the 25 years, we're going to talk about this also. A question to Alex. Um, how much work is it then to install an inter-array cable? Could you give us there how much work this is? I mean, see, so the, the, the installation begins, you know, for me, almost at the, the inception of the, the design and the order. You know, the, the planning starts at that point, you know, where we, we, we start to, you know, look at the, the field layout, you know, we, we work with the client on their deployment strategy, you know, and for me, we are then sort of coming in as they, for me, you know, collect the cables from the manufacturing plant, Ross and the team in Newcastle will be, you know, getting ready to deploy the equipment at that time, you know, huge, you know, a, a, a amount of containers that generally goes off for for one of these so so the planning phase alone you know is you no know, six months to a year as we come up <laughs> we, we work with the client in terms of you know how we inspect offshore you know the, the quality planning aspects before we even get into you know actually doing the work and you know taking the guys off safety briefs we will for me have trade tests To, to ensure the quality, as Ross talked about, about, you know, we're 40 highly skilled technicians, you know, who, who are skilled across a, a, a range. So, and then we get into, you know, dealing with what happens offshore. So we will have a plan, but we know as soon as we get out there, that plan won't stay. We have, you know, agreed rates of connection, but weather comes in, you know, if there's any issues that are picked up in terms of, you know, what's been presented to us in terms of the TPs themselves, that can cause delays. And it's a constantly evolving plan. And really, the, the teams offshore are agile in terms of their reaction and their problem solving and, and how they bring all the individual elements together, you know, to, to create a successful deployment, you know. And, and I think for me... It, We've talked about, we'll see the video, you know, getting the resonance test set off, you know, for, for the for the first time and, and having that set up, you know, for me was a huge logistical effort, you know, and 
not just for us, but for the client to understand how they were going to take that onto their OSS and actually deploy it. They know they wanted to test. Actually, how, how do we get that to work? So, you know, for me, all, all the safety briefings, all the risk assessments, review of all the, the, the paperwork that goes with that in terms of operation. And then for me, as, as we, we achieved at the weekend, the, the, the first successful test, you know, so for me, there was a, a nice little smile on our faces, but we know in terms of the, the Hornsey project, we have still got a, a long way to go in terms of both installation and testing. So it's just, a, you know, it'll be a, a few months before we breathe easy and uh, celebrate. Mm -hmm. I can imagine quite a lot of work as you give us this insight. Thank you very much. Detlef Herzog here. Cables, as we heard, of course, are the key link of windmills. Nevertheless, the offshore substations contain much more equipment. Can you give us some more insights how it looks like there exactly? Um, yes, for sure. Um, maybe we can get the slide. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, an offshore substation uh, consists of several platforms uh, taking all the electrical secondary auxiliary techniques uh, that uh, that is needed to uh, to operate a wind farm it's a quite central point of a wind farm where all the turbines the infield cabling comes together um, with uh, the grid connection so um, um, it doesn't play a role if it's a uh, 33 kV solution as we had until now or it's uh, 66 kV, kV uh, solution we will have uh, already now and in the future um, it's um, yeah it's a platform that takes the uh, grid connection to shore that takes the main transformer or converter situation uh, it takes the internal cabling um, the uh, yeah, high voltage switches. Um, it takes the medium voltage uh, switches. So um, it's uh, a lot of s secondary devices uh, taking low voltage uh, for all the lights on the platform. If it's marine lights, helicopter lights, and all that stuff, because you will have in most cases a helicopter landing platform that has to be operational in more or less every time, every case, um, because that's um, the last chance to, to get to the platform when a transfer via a CTV or a, um, a support vessel is not possible regarding to wave heights. And um, so, um, yeah, you have more or less the uh, central components of uh, the turbine there, if, if it's a park master or something to, to operate the, the turbines uh, according to the grid requirements and uh, uh, there you have all the communication stuff uh, um, so you have there the uh, emergency power situation to be operational also, if the grid fails and you have no grid connection, um, you have to be able more or less to communicate with the platform in every stage on every time. So uh, um, there's a lot of devices on that platform to keep it operational, including fire extinguishing situations, uh, stuff uh, you have to take some diesel uh, to operate the uh, emergency power generator. Um, so it's quite a lot of stuff there, quite more than on a turbine. I can imagine. Yep. Thank you very much, Detlef. Um, jumping to Michael Greiner. So as we heard, of course, there's quite a lot of stuff out in the platforms and heavy electric stuff. What's, what does this mean um, concerning also the weight for the mechanical structure? Yeah, <laughs> the electrical guys will not like this answer, but in principle, whatever electric equipment you put into the platform, the weight of the equipment is not um, influencing the mechanical structure of the wind turbine at the substation very much. Um, if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. We jump on it. 
Yeah. Thank okay. You. So in principle, wind turbines are driven by two kinds of loads. Uh, one load is the fatigue uh, load, which accumulates over the lifetime of the turbine. And despite calculating um, fatigue loads is an art of itself, the, the principal rule is the more energy I take from the wind, the higher is the fatigue load for the turbine. And this is not influenced by the weight of any component. And then the other kind of loads which we have on the turbine, these are the extreme loads, which are usually driven by some kind of error states. And I try to make an example here. So um, imagine a wind turbine having a 20-ton uh, transformer at the very end of the nacelle. So that's um, on a lever arm away from the tower axis and it will produce a certain uh, moment at the tower bottom where the red arrow is pointing at. That's uh, the bar to the very left. And to the middle and to the right, you have um, <clears throat> error states of the turbine, which are usually um, designed in such a way that you assume the turbine is running at full power in a heavy storm taking energy from the area of four soccer fields, producing 50 megawatts of power, and then the control system realizes, oops, something is wrong, um, wants to break, realizes, whoops, uh, some of the main brakes are not working. I'm now hitting an emergency brake procedure, turning uh, every brake, every mechanism I have to full stop, and uh, this produces the loads of the higher bars of the graph, which we um, just have seen. And comparing this uh, load from the error states to the static loads, we see that usually the static loads of even the highest, uh, the heaviest electrical equipment covers only three to five percent of what the dynamic loads uh, pr introduce into the wind turbine. But Anyway, uh, despite mechanically, uh, the weight of the electrical equipment is not so important. There are, of course, good uh, economical or maintenance reasons to keep electric equipment as light as possible. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And as we saw in the beginning in our video, quite high waves out there, of course, rough conditions. And uh, Uwe, we prepared another video, I think. We have ki kind of like, it's not an action movie, but we have impressions from the North Sea. Yeah, right. Uh, the topic is that uh, the original intention was to have a uh, uh, live uh, link to the colleagues out there. Yeah. Uh, as uh, the workload is uh, not in our hands, so uh, <laughs> we are uh, then dependent then from the uh, wind park uh, operator, and uh, so therefore we got the night shift. And uh, during the day shift, uh, the guys have to sleep yeah. and uh, to be prepared to start then uh, later in the evening with the night shift doing the testing. Nevertheless, the guys uh, t took some photos and uh, give us some comments on that. And uh, we tried to make out a kind of movie and uh, maybe we can have this movie playing right now. Hi, my name is Tommy. I'm a service engineer of the company Highwood Prüftechnik Dresden. Together with our partner JDR Cables from the United Kingdom, we are here about more than 100 kilometers off the coast in the North Sea to test newly installed 66 kV array cables of an offshore wind farm. Highwood provided the test system and is now supporting the installation and commissioning as well as HV testing on site. Hello, my name is uh, Tony Dalmau charge of the offshore project management for the resonance test in this uh, wind farm. My role in the project is to follow up the testing and coordinate interfaces with uh, other contractors such as uh, scaffolders, inter-array cable contractors, export cable contractors for any potential clash on uh, operations, and uh, mainly HCC or electrical safety representative of the final client. The main components of the test system are located on the roof of the offshore substation. To reach the cellar deck where the array cables arrive, an HV cable running from the roof alongside of the substation down to the cellar deck. The cable to be tested is connected to the connection point there via joints. To get the test system offshore, the main equipment had to be certified by DNV. For this particular project, we are living in a jacket vessel. What this jacket vessel it's a self-elevating vessel equipped with uh, four legs. 
Once on location, the vessel is just raised to uh, the required elevation above the sea surface supported by the seabed. It's a 100% fixed vessel. No, not from our experience. So the vessel slightly moves based on winds and uh, waves, but compared to a floating vessel, it is much more stable. You have to imagine that when a topside is installed, several contractors will want to have access to a topside for different parts, such as transformers, high voltage GIS, medium voltage GIS, control and protection, export cable, inter-array cable, topside outfitting, and the most important contractor, scaffolding. Even if all activities have been defined in preliminary stage procedures by all contractors, clash of operations can't be avoided. Main clash are due to uh, the lifting operations, scaffolding, and room. So, dozens of cable cores need to be tested in this project. But to do so, weather can be a real challenge and may lead to downtime even for several days. Weather may limit the access to the offshore substation, but even if there is access to the substation, still the test could not be performed due to the weather. This project we have faced uh, different challenges such as lifting depending on weather, lifting clashes with uh, other contractors, uh, being depending uh, on uh, on scaffolders. Scaffolders have revealed themselves uh, as uh, the heart of the substation during the initial weeks. Beautiful. As the last picture, I mean, this is uh, wonderful here. It could be also calm outside here, out in the North Sea. And uh, we saw photo material from the actual test campaign. And Uwe, also not only the, the platforms and all the technical and electrical stuff, but also the, the scaffoldings. It's a known big business. You always need scaffoldings around it, no? Yeah, so this is a, a special request for doing the job or on the platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, the scaffolders will not stay or of, uh, the whole lifetime on, on the platform. So they are only the kings of the platform during the installation of the equipment. Yeah. Because you have to protect the equipment, especially the equipment which had to be brought into the, uh, uh, in, in, into the platform. And we're quite happy that uh, a lot of you uh, developed uh, their questions and brought it in via Slido. And think, over we have some questions and we are about half time through this High Vault web talk and we can answer the questions now. Yeah, so maybe one final comment. Uh, and maybe this is my first question also to, uh, to Alex and, and, and Ross. So I put some questions from my side on a list and sent them to the colleagues over on the platform. And the first question I, I was asking was, how about the food? <laughs> so, and they didn't answer. Is that a good or a bad sign? So, uh, you are much closer to them. So, uh, what can you tell us about the living conditions and how good is the food then uh, really on, on, on the vessel? Ross, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> generally, actually, uh, the food is, is pretty good on, on the jack-up vessel and the uh, installation vessels. Um, quite often, um, vessels are actually more well-equipped than you would think. Some people would say they're more like a cruise liner than an installation vessel, but that's, uh, you know, with gyms, games rooms, um, you know, very good chefs on certain vessels. It's not always the same. Uh, there are times when, when you know, the food isn't as good, uh, but... In general, the, the, the conditions are really good, particularly in the North Sea, you know, where there's a lot of activity and a lot of the big big players, uh, vessel-wise, are, are, are there. So actually, in general, the food is very good and, and the guys have a, a good quality of, of, of rest time and, and ability to, to relax off shift. Yeah. We, we, we sometimes weigh them when they come back on shore. Bring them to a restaurant, yes. Okay. <laughs> So, I have already collected some questions here. I switched them also into live modus on Slido. Um, I would like to start uh, with a question to our friends from JDR, as they are the cable manufacturer. And uh, so we have uh, seen, especially also in the background of, uh, of Ross, uh, the discussion about in the array cables. Uh, we also have shortly discussed export cables uh, to connect them the platform to to land and uh, there are still other cables uh, which are there installed as well uh, 
especially also the cables inside the, the wind turbines. And uh, the question which is coming in is, so what are the most stressed cables when we compare the three classes? Well, I mean, you see, I, I think the, the, the highest stress cable in terms of, for me, as an operator, is always your export cable. You know, and uh, I think I was reading a report for me uh, last night and just looking at sort of 2016 and before. So, and um, of the, the, the cable supply did um, had eight failures for me reported. I don't think failure reporting is something that necessarily the industry is strong at. But the, the cumulative figure for those eight failures over the, the previous eight years was £160 million pounds of lost revenue. You know, so so I think inter-array cables, for me, yeah, for me, the, the, the stress. Uh, we've seen some recent industry issues with, uh, you know, cable protection systems, you know, widely reported. But I think the, the planning, for me, of the, the inter-arrays and, for me, how they're utilised is more controllable. The export cable, for me, interestingly, seven of the eight failures reported were in fibre optics within them, and that's led to a real big focus in the, the, the industry. Uh, I don't know, uh, top side cables and the, 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 sort of sub, the, the connections within the TPs, for me, I think for me, we, we don't um, see, see a lot of feedback and failure from those. But for me, to, to me, the, the highest focus and therefore probably the highest stress cable because it's uh, exporting all the power from a, a particular wind farm would be, be that, that export cable. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here, which I would like to uh, put on the desk of Michel. Uh, operating equipment offshore would require high robustness. What is the impact of salt water, storm, icing and other conditions? Uh, so uh, we have there, from the electrical engineering perspective, uh, so we don't would like to have conductive water anywhere. So, but maybe there's also some topics in terms of mechanical uh, restrictions and also corrosion protection. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are from the mechanical side completely with the electric engineers. We don't want any water, we don't want any salt, any uh, aggressive atmosphere with our nice mechanical hydraulic components. Um, so a lot of lessons were learned on this in the first project. So nowadays in all the modern wind turbines, um, the turbines, uh, uh, um, the insides of the nacelle of the tower, are sealed against the environment, have air conditioning and dehumidifying systems to have controlled um, air inside. So to keep conditions as stable and um, as controlled as possible. Yeah, and relating to everything outside, we paint as much paint on there as possible because corrosion is quite a big challenge. And whenever you damage some kind of uh, um, metal equipment outside and the corrosion protection is damaged, it will start corroding and um, if you then want to need to repair corrosion protection outside it gets, gets really expensive so and usually there is a rough rule of thumb uh, in the industry so if you paint something in a workshop onshore like a tower then for a certain area of tower you pay one uh, money unit to make proper corrosion protection if you then have a damage and need to paint the same area offshore, you pay 50 to 100 times as much money as in the onshore workshop. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. So now I have a slight computer problem here. Some more question. Yeah, I have more, some more questions. Nevertheless, I cannot find them any longer. Ah. I think we should continue because yes. we have a second, uh, a second session Absolutely. where we take up the questions. A second round. I and think of I course, have to restart uh, my system as, here. As always in the High Vault Web Talk, uh, we cannot answer all the questions. Of course, we collect them sometimes. And Uber also in the debriefing of the 
web talk um, can give you more answers maybe also later on let's jump to alex um, uh, another question here in this panel having a more general view on the equipment um, are then the cables and the cable accessories alex the most critical items I think we've discussed everything offshore is critical. From our viewpoint, the the connection of our, our cables into to the switch gear, no, and therefore the the connectors, and also the connections into the the, the offshore substations, are critical. You know, and it's the it's the point where, for me, you know, we we're taking a relative commodity product, you know, tying it into you know a, a, a bespoke cable design. And we're heavily relying on the, the workmanship, you know, of everybody involved in that, you know. And, and as Ross pointed out, you know, we 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 can't nip away and find a replacement, you know. For me, if we do it wrong or something happens or we we have a failure, in, you know, of a test at that point, it, it it does become critical, you know. And therefore, you know, for me, you know, selfishly, we, we view that as the, the most critical part of the, the, the wind farm because actually it, it stops the, the generation, it stops, you know, for me, the, the revenue from, from the client's point of view. So for me, that, that connection between our cables, the connectors and then the switch gear it, it is where we focus a, a, a lot of our um, sort of effort into to understanding what happens when the, the cables become active, you know, looking at the, the data, ensuring you know, that for me we, we're not seeing overproduction, you know, against the, the, the design of the cable, you know, and therefore no either damage into the cable itself or damage into the connector, you know, so yeah, absolutely critical for us, but we, I think we are just selfish and I'm sure we, Michelle will for me, uh, disagree with us. <laughs> Want to ask Michelle also? Could you add some more points? To relating to the critical components of wind turbine, usually everything which is moving is critical. Uh, electrical yeah. items we have in the wind turbine as cables are usually quite gentle components. But if you come to rotating mechanisms to turn the nacelle or to break a rotor or hydraulic units to operate brakes um, or switching mechanisms. These are usually uh, the things which are most critical to the turbine since they age a lot under, uh, under the operation and need to be properly maintained. All right, but the sense of it all is it has to move, of course. We want the energy out of it. Going to another question, um, how important, Ross, is the safety and the compliance to rules and procedures? Could you give us a little bit insight in this subject? You're on mute, Ross. Oh, no. Sure. Oh, great, we hear you. <clears throat> We're back. So yeah, so uh, we think we've got a slide on that, but I'll uh, I'll start off by by giving a, a, you know a general introduction, which is of course safety is at the forefront of, of everything we do. Everyone offshore bring in the slide um, now. As has that uh, at the forefront of their mind, and and the reason for that um, you know is because uh, the the, it's, the job is critical, the risk is very high, and it's, it's mm -hmm. escalated by that, that offshore environment. So we need to consider that, but also before the guys can even get offshore, that that picture that you can see there in the in the uh, in the top with the guy climbing the tower, before we can even get a technician offshore, you know they've got to go through a global wind organisation course, you know which covers first aid, sea survival, working at height, manual handling, all that kind of stuff. And um, that's before they can even go off. You know they need life jackets, harnesses, um, climbing kits, training, and all of that before we'll even let them loose on the trade that they're training. So, you know, that's that's critical um, and, and it really sets the tone for their experience offshore. Um, you know, many companies run safety programs. JDR is no exception to that. Uh, you know, we have uh, the proactive think safety and think quality programs. You know, that, that are the backbone of everyday life uh, offshore. And, and offshore, that life can be can be really tough for the guys. You know, we talk about safety, and 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 that also comes to in the environment they're working in as well, and their mindset. So, you know, when they're working twelve-hour shifts, seven days a week, mm -hmm. 
um, for periods of two to three weeks. This, this is a long period of time where they have to focus and we're expecting them to, to be at their optimum all, all that time, which is why it's so important to make sure that they get adequate rest and they understand what it is that they've got to do and when they've got to do it. A lot of the guys that, that are offshore, um, they don't know how cut out they are for offshore until they go. So, you know, we get a lot of our talent from the onshore industries, uh, such as utilities, and, and we then rely on, on you know, their, their base training that they've already got. We add to that with the, with the offshore training uh, and then the connector manufacturer training and, and our own product training um, to give them what they need to ensure that, you know, they work in a safe way um, to the correct uh, standards uh, with, with uh, for example, the resonant tester is a good example that we're doing offshore. Just, just to to be able to operate that, mm-hmm. there's serious amounts of safety that come into that. You know, we've got senior authorised persons um, on site which are represented by our clients, um, and everything goes through them. That communication channel is constantly open. Just getting to a point where we ha- can have a sanction to test and allow that HV test to take place goes through numerous barriers because. Uh, again, unlike the, the onshore markets, it's not so easy to clear everyone out and make sure there's absolutely no one anywhere near the mm-hmm. the, the the setup. Uh, instead, you know, we have to make sure that, that um, the test can be carried out safely where mm-hmm. potentially people are, although barriers still still safe. Yeah, I one think. Of, yeah, one more point. It just last really, you know, it comes down to to, to training and and the resource pool. Really, you know, we we. The industry has quite a small resource pool of, say, MV and HV technicians offshore, um, and you know we rely on on that resource pool. And, and as the industry grows, as it is, you know that that needs to replenish it, and we need to increase and improve that. And, and what we really need to do is is work together, get the adequate training, and and to to give access uh, to allow people to come in and backfill those roles. And, and maintain those safe standards to mm-hmm. to really allow us all to, to prosper. All right. I think Detlef Herzog can also put some more points to this, to the subject of security and safety. Yeah, for sure. I, I only can uh, take, take your uh, words mm-hmm. that everybody has to uh, perform uh, a training uh, yeah. to be able to work offshore and he has to be trained on the devices he has to work with and uh, he has to install. Uh, In addition, all the wind farms have their HSE rules uh, putting putting down into an HSE manual that also has to be uh, approved by the authorities and um, nobody is allowed to enter a wind farm without having a site induction so it's uh, always there some kind of induction prior entering a wind farm. Uh, to be familiar with with the situation um, before you get out and Mm -hmm. you will be familiarized when you are on site again. So um, that's that's, uh, one of uh, the main tasks uh, you have to fulfill and most of the inductions are followed by a test. Mm -hmm. So it's for sure it's tested if you have um, understood what what is asked. And um, in addition, um, yeah, if if you get out there, you have to be uh, quite quite familiar with 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 the things you have to, to install. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's a quality situation uh, we always need, and everything has to be put down in some method statements and there has also be a risk assessment in place uh, so that everybody is aware about his job, his tasks and how to fulfill it. All right. And we have a quite interesting video, I think, Uwe. I mean, you are out there. You were out there. Uwe did also this safety training years ago. Um, would you tell us before something or should we first watch the video? No, I think... Uh, I have now restarted uh, the Slido functionality. Oh, I have a lot of questions, so therefore I don't want to, to tell old stories. So therefore I would ask for the video right now so that we have more time to answer some of the questions here. Excellent. Then we see the safety video.
So the safety video, and I think if you watch this with your kids, you have the next action uh, holiday planned. This is for sure, but now really it's absolutely important. And of course, everybody is following these rules uh, to have most of the security as possible out on the platforms. Uwe, Slido is restarted. We have yeah. more questions. Yeah, so we have me where I got uh, a lot of uh, questions. So uh, I would like to start with... Uh, electrical one and uh, that's related to the testing of the 66 kV submarine cables so uh, there the uh, question is uh, what are the reasons that only two methods are allowed according IEC 63026 uh, to test 66 kV cables for lower voltages there are, are up to uh, four methods uh, allowed now it's reduced only to the resonant testing where we have seen the test system here and on the platform and the so-called soak test that's uh, 24 hours uh, operational test uh, without load so i uh, anyone who w would like to take the question i think i think the reduction in the the, the test is but so uh driven by a standardization across the industry, you know, and, you know, perhaps from uh, the likes of insurers, you know, and, and other stakeholders, that they, they, they have a, a set of key tests that they can rely on. I think SIGRA uh, TB841, which was released in September, does detail some more tests, but for me, you know, holds resonance test out there as the, the, the sort of primary method, but but does talk about DAC and, and other testing methods in terms of characterization and uh, understanding of the, the operations of the cables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, 66 kV cable is closer to an, a real high voltage cable than to a medium voltage cable from the design perspective. I found another question uh, going in, in a similar direction. Do you expect in future the trend to go on uh, 66 kV for indirect cables also in old wind farms? Or do we have to expect even higher voltage levels for new installations? So the answer to that question is probably yes to both. For me, some of the, the more recent uh, wind farms have been designed with the capability to, to move up to 66 we, from me internally, are expecting cables to, to move to 132 in the sort of 24, 25, and uh, definitely 132 will be a big player when you move to predominantly floating offshore wind. You know, as a, I think as you look at uh, the auctions like Scott Wind round the coast of Scotland, where there's been uh, 72 separate bids where for me, I think 11 of those packages are for floating installations. So, so we will see a, see a bigger shift and we will see a shift to, to, to higher voltages for interarray cables. Yeah, I think the UK is also a front runner in into this discussion. So we as High World are also uh, requested in some uh, uh, working groups uh, of the Off-Jam uh, Offshore Wind Accelerator. And then we're talking about 132 kV or 100, even 145 kV. Uh, maybe there is a different uh, aspect from uh, the German perspective. Detlef, uh, how do you see uh, this development? Uh, towards 66 or even higher voltage. Is that something we have to expect uh, in Germany as well? Yes, for sure. I think 66 is uh, the way we are going for now. Um, the first uh, platforms uh, operating with 66 uh, on wind farm internal grids are, uh, they are designed in and uh, will be built in, in the next uh, next month's years so um and um yeah i've i've seen the market regarding uh, 110 up to uh, 132 uh, kv for for also for infeed cables but um that's for me is is a bit more future <laughs> future talk, future talk yeah. yeah 66 is the goal we have to solve at the moment okay yeah 
But the high world web talk is always a little bit also ahead yeah, and in looking into the future. <laughs> That's why we're doing this, of course, to give you also a little bit of a perspective. Uwe, one or more, or two more questions, or oh, should we jump we into the final more statements? Questions. So we have ten more questions. So ten or even more. This more. is too much. So therefore, I have uh, again the hardest job to to choose. Uh, there's one interesting practical question which we can also direct to both of our, our partners here. How long it takes to test the full cable string when the test setup is ready? Uh, the short answer is it must be more than three hours because the standard says we have to apply the voltage uh, for minimum one hour and as we have three phases then it's already then uh, three hours. Then the question is what is uh, setting up and uh, uh, the setup time and also the then uh, to uh, finalize the test. So uh, maybe, Ross, what is your experience? Yeah, so uh, currently uh, on the project we're on at the moment, we're, we're averaging uh, sort of six to seven hours uh, if we get a clear run. Um, what you need to remember is that the uh, access to the area um, with the permits and things, we have to do the first test, wait for the all clear to be given, um, de-energize the cable and then we need to go in we need to to change around some of the connectors uh, that takes uh, some time to to disconnect the fissures and move them around um, and then potentially we have some switching operations to do as well uh, on the turbine in order to then start the test so typically uh, on, on a good day you can you can do them in in, in I would say a shift I'd say a 12-hour shift is is really um, the best best practice for, for doing it. You can try to squeeze two in if you've got them set up side by side and you don't need to move the test equipment. Um, but, but, but certainly a uh, 12-hour shift for, a, for, a, for one full test of a cable. Dead left, what is your experience? Yeah, I... I yeah, it, it's the same. It takes a shift more or less to, to test the cable. Uh, if you test the full string, yes. Great. Yeah, one question uh, to Michel. Uh, any idea where the long-term mechanical stress on dynamic cables used for floating offshore wind turbines or the wind turbines as such affect their electrical thermal performance? So when we're thinking into the new direction of floating uh, structures, uh, then we would have much more moving parts. So is that then more critical or not? <laughs> In, in principle, we have a lot more uh, challenges with floating wind, uh, uh, especially with uh, coming to the dynamic situations of the whole system, as uh, we have uh, already talked before. But relating now especially to the uh, um, the inner array cables of the wind turbine, in principle, the problems for this cable will stay the same um, as before, so the cable will go through the structure of the wind turbine, will be in some um, free floating um, state coming down to the seabed, but then when it touches the seabed, so it gets tricky because um, the cable will move from the movement of the floating structure, it will move from tidal streams, from mm -hmm. weather conditions, and there will be a point where the cable is... Uh, moving against the fixed seabed, uh, possibly moving against uh, stone armor of the ground which has been placed there, so and relating these cables. That's a challenge to make sure that uh, we come from the moving structure, the moving cables, uh, we have it properly protected where it touches the solid uh, surface of um, the seabed until it's safely buried in. That's the challenge of floating wind. Uh, and, and I would agree. I think if we take uh, floating offshore wind, it's going to be a very different uh, place to operate in terms of not just the, the the floater structure, but in terms of how we contract and define what's happening. So actually, we're going, we're going to have to take a much more collaborative cross-industry view of floating systems, you no know, right from the start, right from their inception. In terms of the performance of the electrical cable, if we have an understanding of the, the floater motions, the the, the, the buoyancy, you know, a, a traditional sort of lazy S down to the seabed, control of the tether systems, and we, we have a, a properly designed package in terms of the, the, the cable sheaf armour, 
then for me, the, the fatigue performance should far outlast any electrical effects with the, the cable. So we, we, if we've done all that properly, we shouldn't be generating hot spots. If we have issues with you know any part of that system where we say put the the, the cable into a compression instead of you know sort of maintained, we we, we could start to to create those uh, sort of effect initiation sites where we could start to see you know electrical performance degrade in hot spots. But that is why it needs to be a real collaborative approach and, and very much a systems driven approach in floating offshore wind. Okay, two more questions, Uwe. Yeah, so I will do it in that way. So I have one very specific UK-related question where I believe it must come from a wind park developer. Uh, and then are there are a lot of questions regarding the test system. I try to uh, run through that uh, by giving direct answers. So the question... Uh, to the UK, is there be enough skilled labor to install 66 kV terminations as USA, Taiwan, France and other markets come online as large UK projects under the construction? So the question is, are there sufficient people available to do the job? If we don't take action now, no. For me. So skills investment and a the skills agenda, not just in the UK, I think it's across the the, the, the whole of Western Europe, will, will become a, an issue and it, it, it will drive costs in, in terms of wind farm installations and cause delays. So so we really need to be looking at, you know, the, as Ross mentioned, uh, upskilling, taking people from other industries, you know, you know, supporting them for me, but also making sure that as JDR do that we have, you know, apprenticeship schemes to, to bring, you know, people in direct from school, train them up, introduce them to the industry and give them all the core skills for them to have a long and successful career in, in offshore wind. Thank you. And I take a joker uh, in the way that I got an additional very important question and uh, that's very interesting as well. Offshore safety and electrical safety are two separate aspects. Who is responsible at high seas to define the right set of rules? So on the platform, you might come into conflict between requirements from an electrical safety perspective and also from the operational perspective of the, uh, uh, of the offshore operation. Uh, who is taking the lead uh, on the platform? Who is the captain who says uh, what to do? The, uh, the installer's um, SAP, senior authorised person, is, is ultimately who we take our, uh, our demands and, or, and orders from. Essentially, we, uh, from, from an, an inter-array side, uh, Mikhail, maybe you can, can add on to that. Yeah, in, in, in principle, it's quite simple. There are uh, a lot of rule sets in place. You can also add um, safety on vessels coming to the equation, but in the end, it's always uh, always the highest risk standard applies. So if uh, a ship safety rule uh, is more stricter than an electrical rule, then you apply the ship's rule. If the electrical rule is more stricter, then you apply the electrical rule. And that's it. Interesting. I, 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 would, I would just add that from a, from a JDR perspective that all our guys have told that if they don't feel safe, they stop, they ask the question, you know, and it, it doesn't matter who's complaining, you know, and I, I think that's an approach that we see in a, a lot of contractors across the industry, that, that safety is, you know, it's not lip service, it's the number one thing, but uh, it is actually... You know, and you know, and I think that's important that we we continue that and don't let those standards slip. All right, all right. Even if we could not answer all the questions, I think right now I, I need to to ask for one additional minute to take a bunch of questions mm -hmm. and to give some basic answers to that. Right. So there were a lot of questions, what were the restrictions, limitations, and also the challenges to the test system. 
There is a short answer, and the short answer is uh, to get the right set of uh, specification. So, for instance, we had weight limitations. So, we started with an original idea of uh, having the, 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 the heaviest part, 5 tons. In the end, uh, it goes down to 2.5, to 2.7, 3.5, 4. In the end, uh, we have now a solution at uh, 3.7 tons. That was the was one of the biggest challenges to us, and the, the second uh, biggest challenge to us was then also the certification for the offshore operation, because that's something where you have to tie in completely new suppliers uh, to do then a DNV con conform uh, design and approval so that you really get the equipment then on site. There's a lot of questions regarding uh, partial discharge measurement. Uh, yes, the system, as we have seen in the beginning, this is equipped with an uh, P filter so that we can do a perfect uh, PD measurement there. There was also the question, are you measuring only the first uh, part of the cable from the platform to the first windmill? No, we are measuring the complete strings. So that means also that uh, we have also then uh, comp to compensate the, uh, the high capacitance also for this long length, uh, which is uh, above 20 kilometers for the longest strings. And uh, then is always also a question, what about uh, DAC and VLF for 66 or even 132 kV? According IEC standard, there's a very clear answer. Uh, uh, this is only allowed up to uh, 36 kV, above 36 kV, only resonant testing and uh, soak test is allowed. And uh, yeah, so I think that was the majority of that. There are also some questions regarding testing HVDC cables. And uh, there I will come back to it later on. Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, we have to conclude yeah. right now. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We were talking in this first High Vault Web Talk in this season of about installation and testing of electrical infrastructure. And as you know, of course, we have our final statement round very short this time because we are already over time. We would start with uh, Michel, your final statement about the today's session. Yeah, so... Uh um, despite everything and all the challenges we have discussed uh, today, uh, there's been a lot of um, maturity in the offshore wind industry over the last years. So basically, um, if offshore wind palms are planed today with the modern technology, they have 15 to 20 megawatt wind turbines and are usually profitable without subsidies. So uh, the industry is ready to work, and I hope that the policymakers will allow us to deliver clean energy to the world. Wow, nice. Thank you very much. And Ross, your final statement. I think from, from, from my side, uh, the key thing really is, you know, the industry is at a point now where uh, growth is inevitable. It's uh, everyone's talking about it. We can see that with the with the climate uh, things in Scotland recently. And really, what what I'd like to say is is that we we all need to, to work together in order to deliver um, these complete systems offshore. And I think uh, some more joined up thinking is needed in some areas, particularly on the man manning side and technicians. But I think that working together, we can we can we can do that, and and hopefully provide uh, the services that are required globally in the coming years. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much at this point. I would say, before we come to the final statement of Uwe, um, thank you very much to Ross Piercy, to Alex McFay, to Detlef Herzog, uh, live here in Dresden, and to Michael Greiner. Thank you very much. And Uwe, now your final statement, and then we give a view to the next High World Web Talks. Yeah, so I would like to take this one minute at the end uh, to say thank you. Thank you to the core team of uh, the uh, developers of of the WRVO, as we call our, our offshore unit here, and uh, a special thank to all the 250 employees of High World, which have 
really supported us uh, to make it possible in less than a year to develop a completely new technology and to bring it on a platform. And as we have seen, it's up working and uh, it's uh, robust out there. And uh, this is a very great success of all our colleagues here in Dresden. And there is my personal very special thank you for all the support we got there in the last months. Thank you very much. And really, I mean, one of you who is not very young, I would say, knows still Dallas. It was the time when we say Tuesday is Dallas time. Do you know this yeah. still? And Tuesday is... Of course, Tuesday is High Vault Web Talk time. Then we have uh, two more sessions, the next Tuesday and the Tuesday in two weeks. Right. What, uh, did we prepare for these sessions? Yeah, next week we will talk about cable monitoring and there especially HVDC cable monitoring. That is my reference to the HVDC questions we got also uh, on Slido. So this is something what we will take up then next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a special uh, event then on November 23rd where we have collected all the questions and open questions we couldn't answer or which are not really fitting to the individual uh, uh, sessions we had so far. So we collected them and we invited a panel of our colleagues from academia and also from High World, uh, the experts all around transformers, cables, so, so that we can answer these questions. And the, the most important thing is, uh, to get the questions already up front so that we can answer as much questions as possible and therefore we have our final slide mm -hmm. there we can see the uh, email address webtalk at highworld.com so okay. maybe we can see we the can slide see. there Thank right you. and there you can see the email address where we collect then also the questions then for the session on the 23rd so we are looking forward to meet you first of all next Tuesday at 3 Central European time and then the Tuesday afterwards. Ross, Alex, Detlef and Michael, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much to our team behind the scenes and of course thank you to Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn. Uh, best sidekick in the world I would say. Always fully interested and with the best answers. Thank you for <laughs> I would say. See you next week. Thank you and bye-bye from Dresden.